Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with more tales from the trenches of the freelance classical music musicians circuit in Manhattan and New York and, and the boroughs, of course. And today I want to tell you about how I made my Carnegie Hall debut, or how a classical music lover with no talent and minimal skill can actually play on the great stage. It really was kind of remarkable, if I do say so myself, not because not because I was anything special, but because I wasn't. I mean, that was the whole point. So when I got to New York um, and started working in banking, actually, I was working in real estate banking back in the days in the 1980s, I wanted desperately, desperately to play because I had been, you know, percussionizing around the peninsula when I was a graduate student at Stanford out in California and then before that with the Johns Hopkins Symphony. Now, I had no talent whatsoever. At various times, I have played clarinet and piano and viola and and I've tried everything and I sucked at absolutely everything I touched. I, I really, because I, I didn't have the, I didn't have the drive. You know, I wasn't being pushed by my parents. In fact, they would have preferred if I'd done nothing at all, I think, um, given my evident musical skills. And, and and when you start picking up an instrument and you're in college, you know, for the first time, or in, you know, high school actually is when I started with, with seriously taking up again for the second time piano, uh, you know, you, you just don't have time. You've got other th interests, other things, and unless you're willing to devote your whole life to it and really work at it, especially if you have no talent whatsoever, it takes a lot more work, you're never going to get very good. And I never got very good. I mean, I, I, I got... I could play Beethoven's Panatique Sonata. I could play Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C sharp minor. And I could play Debussy's Children's Quarter, at least all except the snowflakes are dancing, which was way beyond me. And, you know, other, other individual little tidbits that I wanted to play. And I could do them, you know, so that you could recognize what they were. Um, I thought that was an achievement. And as far as the clarinet goes, oh dear, that was something else. And that's what I studied most of all, even more than piano. But that I had to give up because every time I practiced, our dog would try and chew its way through my bedroom door to attack me and make it stop. And I just I couldn't continue to torture the poor creature. I just couldn't. So anyway, and viola, eh, less said the better. So uh, the bottom line is I became a percussionist. Why? Because you can, I, I, well, I mean, I knew the whole repertoire by heart. I didn't even have to count most of the time. Sometimes that was a mistake, but most of the time it wasn't. And, and you know, percussionists, real percussionists, are taught to, you, you, to keep playing no matter what. Well, all orchestral musicians are. Even if you're screwing up, you don't know. You Once it's time to go, you go. And you never stop. In fact, in fact, I saw this happen in the most alarming way when Leonard Bernstein was conducting Mahler's Rückert Leader with Thomas Hampson and the Vienna Philharmonic of all things. And some of you may know Um Mitternacht, that lovely song with entire wind band scoring. That's all it's written for. And then harps and piano at the end. And the piano is doing arpeggios, the harps, they're, they're together. And then, then the glissandos and all this stuff. And the, the pianist um, in question was obviously a ringer, someone who'd been hired for the concert. And he couldn't follow Bernstein's beat. And when he came in, he started playing his part at double tempo, twice as fast as the music was actually going, which sounded just insane. Because, you know, Hampson is up there going, to hell, Steve, the piano's going, whoop, crash, and everybody was off. It was really hellaciously awful. And at the end, when Bernstein walked off stage, he did this to the pianist. He made his fist at him. It was like, you mother. Well, I'm not going to say. It was really quite quite amusing. But the reason is because he, he couldn't correct himself. Once he got going, at whatever tempo he thought he was going, he was going to finish his part, come hell or high water. And that's what they teach you to do. And when I was studying clarinet, too, it was the same thing. If you squeaked, it was like, nope, keep playing. Always keep playing. Well, so if a percussionist loses count and they're off, they're going to stay off. And there are many recordings, and I've seen it happen many times, where that's exactly what goes wrong. And when I played percussion, sometimes I would miss. Sometimes I was not on. But it wasn't because I didn't know when to come in, because I knew the part by heart. I mean, I knew every single part 
by heart virtually in the standard repertoire that we would be doing. When we did newer, unusual repertoire, it was another issue. I actually had to count and read the parts, and I could do that too. I mean, you know, but but it was more fun to just just know the music and be carried along as you crash and bang your way through it. So. I had my tam tam and my cymbals and my other instruments, which I had purchased in my, you know, peregrinations through California and other places. And because I was free, that was the key. I was a hot commodity in, you know, the local New York chamber orchestra, you know, community orchestra scene, which needs players, number one, and they need instruments. Number two, and percussion instruments particularly. I mean, people who run around with timpani in their back pocket and bass drums. I owned a bass drum. I had a, tam I had a whole percussion section that I managed to purchase because I was working as a banker. So I was single and had some disposable income and I amassed a percussion section. But if they wanted my percussion section, they had to get me, unless I wasn't interested in what they were doing, in which case they could borrow it. You know, I didn't care. So... There I was, have Tam Tam will travel. And I had friends who I'd known from California who are now in New York. They were mostly uh, sort of focused on the Manhattan School of Music, not so much Juilliard, although I knew some people there too. And, <clears throat> and all of these musicians made a living freelancing. They were all freelancers. It's just like it's just like the the um, you know the the London the UK early music mafia, where you know you've got the same ten people who form the nucleus of all the period instrument bands in, in London, no matter what they're called, you know the Academy of Ancient Music and and and, and the English Concert and the Taverner Players and the the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. It's all the same people. They just change their names when they're playing different things and they're pickup musicians. They play per gig. And that's what I was. I mean, I was the free one, the one who just showed up with a gong or whatever else they needed. And I'd bash and crash the thing and then go home. It was fun. It was so much fun. It was a great time. It was in the 90s, the late 80s and the 90s. So one of the organizations that I got myself into was the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra, which was founded by a, a, a splendidly energetic conductor named Richard Alden Clark. Now, Richard Alden Clark is now a, a professor in charge of um, orchestra and dance, I believe, at Butler College. He's still out there. He does all kinds of interesting and unusual repertoire, which is a person after my own heart. And I participated in several recordings with the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra. Perhaps we could talk about those later. But one of the things he was doing was he was, uh, you know, putting on a concert series with the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra, which could be enlarged depending on how many people he needed <clears throat> and how much funding he could get, of course. And we had a couple of concerts at Carnegie Hall, and I got to play in them. The first one was uh, Rimsky-Korsakov, Scheherazade which was just enormous fun. We did Scheherazade. I also think, I, one of those concerts, we also did we also did Gershwin's Cuban Overture. Now, in the Cuban Overture, I was the clavicist. I played claves, you know, wooden sticks. You hold a wooden stick and it goes click, 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 in the Cuban Overture. And we also did an American in Paris. I mean, it was great. It was so much fun playing that stuff. And then Shostakovich V, where I was, of course, the tam-tam player and then the bass drumist at the very end. Now, it's actually very interesting. You know, Shostakovich and Russian composers generally have a reputation for being somewhat crude in terms of their orchestral sound. But Shostakovich was an extremely accurate orchestrator. What most people don't realize is that the tam-tam has one crash in the first movement, one crash in the finale. There is no percussion besides uh, glockenspiel and xylophone in the slow movement. And the bass drum doesn't come in until the very end. The really very, very, very end. It's da 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 dum bum ba da 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 dum ba da 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 bum ba da 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 dum ba da 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 ba da. That's where the bass drum comes in, in the coda of the finale. So that's all I had to do. It wasn't very much. But so I mean, that meant I got to do what I did best and love to do most, which is sit in the back of the orchestra and do nothing and just listen and watch because there's no better place to be than a percussionist at the back of the orchestra and you can just sit there and watch everybody else do all their stuff. You learn so much. It tells you so much about the inner workings of the orchestra and you hear things that 
you know, you'd never hear on recordings. So I was enjoying myself sitting there doing mostly nothing and staring out at the audience. Now, Carnegie Hall, if you've been there, is really tall. It has like, it has like four or five balconies. And when you're watching it from the audience side, which is where I was, you know, you see everybody on stage, it's beautiful. The best seats, by the way, are the front of the balcony, as high up as you can get and all the way in the front because you can see everything and the sound just comes floating up to you. It's just marvelous and they're the cheaper seats. So it's really kind of a, you know, insider story. If you ever go to Carnegie Hall, get balcony seats. If you could do a little stairs on that last leg, the elevators take you almost to the top, but not quite. So anyway, anyway, but if you look at it from the stage, it's fascinating because it's just this like, it's this vertical space and, and everybody is like plastered against the back wall. It's almost like two dimensions. It reminded me of one of those, one of those, you know, butterfly things where you stick pins through the dead insects and everything is stuck up on the wall. That's what Carnegie Hall looks like. So my first concert was Shostakovich V from the stage of Carnegie Hall, the illustrious Carnegie Hall. So, you know, the old saying, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. No. Own a tam-tam and, more importantly, play it for free. Because free is the operative word in the performing arts industry. I mean, if you're there and you'll do it for nothing, you're golden. So we did, we did that. Then we did Scheherazade. And Scheherazade was really interesting. It was a separate concert um, because I got to play, of course, my tam-tam. But there's only one tam-tam whack in Scheherazade at the end of the finale, at the climax when the ship goes to pieces and all that stuff. Otherwise, I played the triangle. Now, there is, there is quite a bit to playing the triangle. You wouldn't think, but there is. First of all, there are lots of different kinds of triangles, and they all have different, different timbres, from silvery and, 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 and delicious to sort of clangy and dinner bell-like. But, you know, the triangle it can, can have a surprising dynamic range. It really can. Uh, you'd be amazed how loud the sucker can be. It's hard to get it to play quietly because it basically, you have a striker and you have a piece of metal and there's a limit. You know, you could try and not hit it as hard, but to do that in rapid succession, when you have multiple beats, well, it re does require actually some technique, none of which I had. But happily, modern day triangles come with, a, you can buy a separately, of course, a set of triangle strikers. These are beaters, little metal rods. I could show them to you, but they're downstairs of, of different weight. So it doesn't matter how hard you hit the thing, because if you have a very thin, very light, sort of like knitting needle type, type striker, cannot make a loud sound. You simply can't because there isn't enough weight there to activate all the metal in the triangle. And if you want to do a hard strike, you get the heavy, thick one and you just go ding and you get bong. You know, it's, it's, they're fabulous. They, they handle the dynamic range issue for you. Now, of course, if you have to make diminuendos and crescendos with the same stick, oops, that's a little more complicated. So you take a, a moderate size beater and you can, you can do limited dynamics, but not easily. So for Scheherazade, there was one part that I was never happy with on recordings, particularly, and I worked really hard to find the right sound. It's in the finale. And, you know, when they're all going, da, 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 ba, da, 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 and the brass go, da, 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 cymbals, da, 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 ba, 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 da, chung, chung, you know, that business, right? Well, the triangle is playing through the whole passage. It's a giant long roll. It lasts like a minute or 30 seconds or something, which is a long time in music. And I wanted to have this, this, this beautiful, tinkly, vibrant triangle sound where you couldn't hear individual strikes and it didn't sound like a, a, an alarm going off or a telephone ringing. So I got two triangles. I was very proud of this. I got two triangles, one of which was a, a, a sort of modern, heavy metal, you know, nice little bell thing. And the other was kind of a, a just a simple metal triangle. They, those, you can get those two with a, with a, a more, a more dissonant sound, more overtones, harsher sound. And I took two very light beaters, the lightest I got, and I played both of them simultaneously like this. I put them on the stand and I was just, you know, as I was, you know, hitting them both with two beaters like this. So you had a completely 
unmeasured tremolo. And, and the, the combined sound of the two triangles just made this beautiful gauzy sound. I just loved it. It was wonderful. And then, of course, I got to do my tam tam whack at the climax, and I was extremely happy. But the other Carnegie Hall concert I did that I thought was really memorable, it was just funny, it was fun to do. I, there was a guy named Peter Taboris. He's still around. Peter Taboris. He's a conductor of a Greek origin. He was born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I remember that because how do you forget somebody who's born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, right? So uh, he has a company. He still has it. It's called Mid-America Productions. And there's a, an offshoot of it now called Mid-America International. And what Mid-America Productions used to do was they would find... Um, Decent choirs, well, it's mid America, mostly in the Midwest and in the South and in that part of the country, and they would they would organize Carnegie Hall concerts for these high or high school choirs for the most part, and you know they they would pay, of course, they pay the, the members of the choir would pay Mid America Productions, and Mid America would organize a concert in Carnegie Hall, and so all these kids would come. And their parents would come and they would fill up Carnegie Hall and everybody was happy. And so for them, some of these concerts um, were choral concerts, a lot of them were chorus plus orchestra. And he needed an orchestra. And for some of these concerts, he hired the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra, Richard Alden Clark's orchestra. He didn't always conduct, but you know, he, he rented us out as part of the orchestra. And in one of these concerts was John Rutter the wonderful carols for choir, John Rudder choral guy conducting his own works. And he was doing, I think he was doing, let's see, he did, he did the Requiem, he did the Magnificat, and I think his Te Deum. I think it was those three works. So I was playing cymbals in the Te Deum part, or the one that was not the Magnificat and the Requiem, and, and bongos in the Magnificat, which was quite a bit of fun. Now, I'm in the back, and the chorus is behind me. And I was an enthusiastic percussionist, you know, when it was my turn, I got up there and just whacked the crap out of whatever, whatever I was supposed to be whacking. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and I just remember some of the soprani, the soprani in the orchestra from wherever they were from in mid-America saying to me, oh, you know, could, you're being so loud. Could you quiet down on those cymbal crashes in a te deum, like this huge choir? Well. As anybody will know, you never, ever, ever ask a percussionist to play more quietly because all that does is urge them on to greater efforts of enthusiasm and volume, which is precisely what happened here. I made sure I was standing right next to the girl who asked me when I hit my cymbals, bang! And it's like, you know. But in the Magnificat, the opening movement of the Magnificat has a part for bongos. The, the choir is going, Magnificat, Magnificat, Anima May. I mean, the bongos have this chunk, 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 chunk. Now, there is a limit to how loud you can play bongos. I mean, there really is. I, I, you know, I mean, because you're hitting them with your fingers and whatnot. And, you know, they're kind of small. And one is bigger and one is smaller. And, <clears throat> and John Rutter, who is just the nicest, most patient, pleasant human being that, that, that ever wrote music. And his music is like that too. You know, some people find it sort of formulaic and, and, and conventional, which it is. I mean, let's face it, but it's very well written. And people love playing it and singing it. There's nothing wrong with that. So he kept saying to me, you know, bongos, could you be a little louder? Bongos. And then, and then he, he said to the choir, he said to the choir, choir, it, it, it wants joy. It wants enthusiasm. Imagine yourself running down the streets of Seville, clicking your castanets. And he said to them, so I raised my hand, of course, and he says, yeah. And I said to him, you want castanets? He said, the part's for bongos, but I got castanets. You want me to play it on castanets? I got them right here. I had my castanets. And he looked at me like I was insane. And he said, no, no, play it on the bongos, but louder, please. It has to have more I just have more feeling. How oh, much feeling am I going to get out of a pair of bongos? So I took a couple, a couple hard mallets, and I just banged the crap out of those castanets. I mean, not castanets, bongos. I mean, bong, 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 bong. and let me tell you, it was the best performance of the bongo part in Rudder's Magnificat that you'll, that you ever have heard in your life.
But anyway, I just wanted to share these stories with you. These were some of my, my Carnegie Hall things as an itinerant musician in the Manhattan freelancing world. Um, it was a wonderful period, just a joyful and delightful period where I learned so much about the inner workings of orchestras and the music scene and, and, and just innumerable things and met fantastic people and wonderful musicians. I still pity them <laughs> if they're still playing. Boy, it's a, it was, it was a, it's a chore. It's a chore and it's a labor of love with, without a doubt. So there you are, friends. Keep on listening. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll be back at some point with more, more scenes from the trenches in this little periodic series. It's fun to talk about. I hope you enjoy hearing. I'd, be, I'd love to hear your stories, too, because I know so many of you are, first of all, real musicians and fine musicians. And I know you've got a bunch of juicy ones to share. So take care and thanks again.